My name is Nima Barnett, and I'm the filmmaker, director of uh, one of the producers of Civil Brand. I'm Joyce Lewis. I'm the co-screenwriter and associate producer of Civil Brand. We are here to tell you about Civil Brand. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, there's not enough tape to tell them the whole story, Joyce, I don't think. That. I know, we could be here forever. Yeah. Oh, look. Yep, here Sabrina. we are. Yep. This prison, um, I shot this film in Nashville, Tennessee, in a historical landmark prison, the same prison where they shot the Green Mile, and it was huge. Unfortunately, I only had about 10 extras, so I had to be very creative. There's Sabrina, Joyce. That's the character you created that saved the movie at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Sabrina is um, modeled after a lot of the research about uh, young black women who are in prison that have um, a history of being incarcerated. And um, young and just kind of aimless, you know. Changed my life. And so we, we used her, we put her on top of the story that already existed. We got to give mad props to Preston Whitmore. Oh, of the course, second, of course. Who, uh, created uh, the story and laid the foundation for yes, the screenplay. Yes, he did. Yes, Preston Whitmore, uh, and also wrote the first version of the screenplay. Exactly right. And they gave us our character names and, and foundation, as you said. That's right. Mm -hmm. They got the wrong Sabrina down. It could be like 30. And so Sabrina was created to put a structure on top of the structure that already existed. She is uh, our narrator and takes us on the journey of the women at the uh, Whitehead uh, Correctional Institution. Correctional Institution. Mm -hmm. Now, as you see, Lisa Ray sitting next to DeBrat who plays France is very interesting. You know, the shoot was originally a 25-day shoot, and we were scheduled to shoot 25 days in Nashville. After 14 days, I was closed down because Lionsgate bought Trimark and Mandalay, and so we were bought along in the merger. Originally, in Joyce's rewrite, I had a opening scene, which I was really dying to shoot, of Lisa Ray's character, Frances, actually killing her husband in self-defense, because um, from our research, we also found out that large percentage, maybe 75 to 80 percent of, of women behind bars are there because of self-defense. Uh -huh. Self-defense and crimes of survival. And crimes of survival, crimes of survival. right. And um, I couldn't shoot that scene. <laughs> couldn't shoot a lot of scenes. And so I was really, really blessed that Joyce, and I think her creative genius came up with, with so much, but particularly with the character of, De of Sabrina, because if I hadn't had her at the end, because um, we waited a year and a half for the other five days and it never came. And then finally, they decided to give us one day to finish the film. We really didn't know what we could do in one day. And so Joyce and I went back into the editing room with uh, our editor, David Beatty, who's a genius. Yay, David. And came in, yes, David. Mad props. Yes, he is. Yes, we give him mad props. He came in and really saved the film along with Joyce and I. We looked at it for about 48 hours and then just figured out what we could do to make the pieces of the film that we had work in some kind of movie. Everything was his, from the fucking roof to the rats. We looked at what was missing, what story points were missing, right. and um, made a list and went back in and put those words in uh, Sabrina's mouth. Yeah. to bridge the story points. So I think you put a lot of words in a lot of people's mouth that day. Because <laughs> actually, yeah. the very opening scene um, with DeBrat, the first shot that you saw in black and white uh, before we cut to the second black and white shot with Sabrina and the reporter, that was shot at Lacey Studios because in the one day Lionsgate gave us, we shot 41 setups and went back and put the film together, attempting to match some of the locations that we had in Nashville. So um, it's it's been a very interesting journey. <laughs> 
I want to talk about the newspaper that Sabrina was holding. It says yes. 25 women win abuse case. And the reason we did that is um, the research showed us that women are starting to uh, have lawsuits against these penal institutions where mm -hmm. their rights are being violated, where they aren't being protected, where they're being raped, and uh, particularly in rape cases. Yes. But they're coming right. out and starting to uh, sue. So uh, we thought that was important for our, our character, our hero, Sabrina, to uh, bring us that information. I, I hope you'll be comfortable. You can put your stuff up there. Yeah, Joyce is absolutely right, and I think another genius uh, element that Joyce brought to the script was the fact that exposing women taking over prison and fighting in, in, the, in the legal system and winning, you know, that doesn't happen too often, or, and, and it rarely gets publicized. I don't know how you feel. It just takes time. Here, let me tell you who everybody is. That right there, that there were a lot of new exciting elements that were added to the rewrite that, um, I don't know, Joyce, I still look at the film and wish we could have shot. I know, I do too. Now here on location, as you see the exterior cell, what I did was I had the production designer, Cindy, who did a great job with no money, build an interior cell in the gym of the prison. Because when I shot the interiors, I wanted to have more flexibility. Uh, I wanted to have the ability to do more of a variety of shots. Unfortunately, <laughs> now look at this scene. See, I never got to shoot the inside of the cells. The cells were designed individually. Little Mama's character had her religious artifacts. Every one of the main characters had their cells home fitted for them. I never was able to get to those shots, and so basically that's why when you see the cell blocks most of the time, you see them in this hallway. But it works. Yeah. I, I just want to go back and say something you said earlier about uh, the women taking over the prison. That, that was in the original script. So I just want I just want to say oh, that. Right. I just want no. to be clear about That's that. That's right. It was. It but was. But the, the the newspaper the, the newspaper the Sabrina character the winning a case the winning the case was exactly. not. And no, I, I just want to be clear. Right. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Well, what what motivated me about the rewrite was the fact that this time these young women had they had a reason for doing what they did, and yeah. before it was no. just arbitrary. They can't pay me enough money to work in this raggedy motherfucker. It's the politics, for instance, right here in this scene. Mm -hmm. What we did with the uh, Shit is crazy. with the wet character, mm -hmm. she became the the political motivator, you know, in in, in our script. Yes, she yeah, became our little young Angela Davis. Yeah. 70s uh, activist, for those of you who don't know who <laughs> Angela Davis is, and still uh, writing books. Her subject now is uh, the prison system. Prison industrial complex. Exactly, mm. what's going on. Her new book, uh, Prisons Are Obsolete. Now, I'm um, looking at this scene, and I remember if you're seeing, if you feel congested and tight, guys, it's because the camera froze. And um, by the time we got a second camera, which was a very difficult task, it was like below zero most of the 14 days we were shooting there. I could only get two shots in. And uh, I never had a dolly through the entire shoot, so I couldn't really move the camera much. But Yuri Nyman, the director of photography, who is quite brilliant, um, Yuri and I had discussed our visual concept early on, and we had... Mm -hmm many scenes that would have opened up the film quite a bit more, but our basic concept was to shoot tight in certain instances to give the feeling of confinement. Mm -hmm. We wanted to shoot tight, we wanted to shoot in high contrast, and um, mm -hmm. we wanted the visual sense, the cinema sense of the film to in some ways counteract what was going on in the scene and, and at other times be redundant to what the scene was doing to really reinforce the moment. Everybody got kids in here. Here we're, we're looking at a sweatshop scene now. I hate to be the bear of sad stories, Joyce. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, it worked out okay. Unfortunately, um, our sweatshop scenes were much <laughs> larger and they were making uh, many more items than yellow, orange material. Uh, that's what they brought in that day and uh, 
that's what I had to work with, but I had hoped that we would have had quite a few more extras to build the sweatshop scenes. There were several very fascinating sweatshop scenes that uh, Joyce had added into the script that uh, I thought felt very important getting the point across about slave labor in the prison system, and, it, you know, we, we didn't get to do it. Yeah. Oh, here's most deaf. Yay. <laughs> we were really happy to get, and, and Clifton, who was really fabulous Clifton as Dee. Clifton Powell. Clifton Powell is so, such a brilliant actor. Who um, won the Best Actor Award at the American Black Film Festival. Yes, he did. Yes, For he his did. role in Civil Brand. Yes, he did. He won the Best Actor Award, and he definitely deserved it. He did. Now, the character of Michael uh, changed quite a bit from the original script to Joyce's rewrite. I wanted to find someone who was kind of funny looking, kind of skinny, kind of cute, and kind of vulnerable. And I thought about this actor I knew named Dante Smith, who I had directed when he was acting with Bill Cosby in the Cosby Mysteries. And when I talked to my daughter about it, she was like, Ma, that's most deaf. I said, who? She said, that's most deaf. I said, who's that? Oh, she, he's a big time rapper. And so I presented the idea to the producers and they were like, oh, he'll never sh shave his sideburns. He won't do this and that. And so I finally got him on the phone and I said, Dante, you remember me? He said, hell yeah, Nima Barnett. And I told him about the project and the next thing you knew, he was down there with shaved sideburns and an interesting character and ready to work. So, you know, shout out to Most Deaf because, yeah. um, Another reason why I chose him, because he is a political artist, and uh, we wanted to choose as many artists that had voices of conviction in some sense of politics to be in this film, because we felt whatever the journey was going to be, we wanted as many people as we could who were of our tribe, and so it was exciting to get Nabushe Wright. Yeah, yeah, who did... Uh Dead presidents mm -hmm. and fresh, fresh uh, on and on and on. Uh, so many films. I, I just want to say that in 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 wanting to bring that the political element to the film, that um, one of the things we went past about in the sweatshop, the conversation between Little Mama and Francis, and Little Mama says. Uh, they're talking about their children. She says, get ready for Mother's Day because it's something in here. And the reason we put that in there is that unless you've been in that experience, we don't realize how tough prison is on women. It's mm -hmm. a whole different experience mm -hmm. than it is for men because when men go to jail, the women take care of the family. When women go to jail, the family falls apart. And Mother's Day and other holidays bring uh, up the pain of that situation. You're absolutely right. And uh, I was just looking at Lisa Ray. She's so gorgeous. Uh, Lisa Ray was uh, one of the few actors that came with the original project. And, and Joyce and I were very, both very excited about working with Lisa Ray. Joyce uh, redefined uh, the role of Frances to better fit her. I had worked with Nabushe on an ABC movie I directed and uh, that Joyce and I worked on. and um, TV movie. TV movie, and always wanted to uh, work with her again. I'm the only one in here that can do She's a phenomenal talent, Nabushe. Uh, she's un very unique, and um, it was wonderful to watch her find Nikki in Civil Brand and work Nikki, you know. Um, the tough girl. The tough girl. Tough girl, sweet. Yeah. yeah. There's my crew in the background uh, dressed as extras uh, because, as I said before, the prison was so large and it was so empty. I was trying to put something in the background to make it, it, make it full. Um, we're coming up to the first scene that begins to deal with the greed in the prison system. I think it's coming up now. Mm -hmm. and, um, with the warden. With the warden. Reed, Reed McCann. Reed McCanns. Reed Live McCanns, who is a very brilliant actor. Absolutely. Has been acting, writing, and directing for many years, particularly on stage and film and television. And uh, he really brought a special quality to the um, character of the warden. In fact, uh, as Joyce says, and we'll tell you later, if we hadn't had him, we probably wouldn't have had an ending. <laughs> That's very true. Reed is very smooth uh, in the role of the warden, and um, 
one of the many elements I, I liked that he brought to the table was the fact that there was a sense of vulnerability and guilt with Warden Nelson. They were just here. But he plays that greed, though. Oh, yes, he, he does. Plays, <laughs> plays it to the hill. Yes, he does. Walker is thinking about pulling their business from them. When I think of Warden Nelson, I always think of the wonderful music that Mandrill, the score that Mandrill laid under Warden Nelson. You know, money, money, money. <laughs> you know, uh, Mandrill came on to do the score and um, did a phenomenal job. Yes, they did. Also part of our tribe in bringing the political consciousness. No question. They have, no uh, question. Uh, had f over the many years that they have been doing uh, music, sixteen no albums. Question. Yes, they they really. It was, it was an experience working with Madrill, putting this score together, and um, they're multi talented. And I was very very happy with the rhythms and the music and the um, just the internal emotion that they their music brought to Civil Brand and they worked for a little, very little money and I'm sure went in debt for doing this. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> Joyce, that's the scene that when the first time I showed Civil Brand to an audience was at the American Black Film Festival and uh, the first day I got there I remember briefly coming into the theater when this scene was happening and I was very nervous. I sat in the back and as soon as um, Deese slapped Aisha, played by Tashina Arnold, who is another phenomenal actress. Oh, my God, actress, yeah. How, yeah, we got to talk about we her. We have to talk about her. That was the first time, and I ran back in my room and called Joyce uh, back in L.A. because when he slapped her, all these black no. women got up and said, oh, no, 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 he has got to go right now. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God. I said, Joyce, they're talking people back were, to the screen. People are responding. People are responding. And, you know, we were so excited. Um... I don't know, those of you who made films understand that you work on something for two years and no one ever sees it, then you're pushed to show it and you feel you never finished it and then suddenly people respond. It's just a feeling that we I, I can't magic. describe. It's magic. It was very magical. I, I, I want to say that I know what your vision was for this film, mm -hmm. you know, because... We walked through this. <laughs> Together. <laughs> Together. And you wrote it. But your vision was not realized in the way that you wanted it to be realized but I gotta say and I told you this from the beginning I make no apologies for this film yes you did you know I love every frame of it yes well um, good make no apologies for it and uh, for some reason people love this film yes they so do so it's not the way that <laughs> we envisioned it but yeah. there's some magic about this this movie yeah that yeah. Uh, no, you're right, comes Joyce. through This is a scene that was shot at Lacey Studios, one of the 41 setups to try to complete the film. Again, Tashina has always been such a terrific actress, and Joyce and I were very happy to, excited about working with her again. I don't think uh, people people knew what a good actress Tashina Arnold really is. In drama. In drama, because yeah. we're used to her, the Martin Show, right. and, you know, comedic roles. But right. She is, uh... She's very gifted. She's gifted. Very gifted. The final day was not shot by Yuri, by the way. It was shot by uh, another one, another wonderful DP. His name is Edward Ed Pay. Pay. Ed Pay. And Ed Pay shot the final day for us, and he did a magnificent job. Yes, he did. He's very gifted. Joyce and I both did the uh, Gail Diva story for Showtime with Ed, and he shot the hell out of it. Now we see another one of our favorites, yeah. MC Light, yeah. in the house. <laughs> Uh, we're both very, very big, big fans of MC Light. She's an exceptional talent and an exceptional human being. And we were delighted that she um, came on board to play the female guard. She really fell in love with Joyce's rewrite and how Joyce described and carved the uh, Cervantes, yeah, Sergeant Cervantes. Cervantes out. So, um, so we were excited about her and also, of course, the brat. We got to talk about the brat because there yes. are so many surprises in this film in terms of performances. I mean, who knew that MC Light really has dramatic skills? But more than that, who knew 
that the brat could act. Because I have to tell you, when, when I wrote Sabrina, I envisioned her as sort of being like an every every woman kind of character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from the, uh, from the research, I wanted her to be poor, uneducated. And in my mind, I actually saw her as a, a a brown skin sister, mm -hmm. dark skin sister. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why, that's just my vision. But Brat brings all of that mm -hmm. from an internal viewpoint mm -hmm. and can act her ass off. Mm -hmm. so oh, there's no question. I, I was really surprised with it. Well, good. I'm glad that you were surprised and with pleased. her. Pleased with her performance. I have to thank Lisa Ray for bringing DeBrat to the table because mm -hmm. they're sisters and she called DeBrat. I mean, most of uh, Sabrina's characterization that Joyce wrote was voiceover. <laughs> when I started working with DeBrat, I was just so blown away by her energy. And thank God I did. I decided to shoot everything on camera. Again, that saved us. This is supposed to be <laughs> uh, the video camera that, you know, the third eye that watches uh, everyone in the prison. Just a few questions. And the, the high black and white shots. Um, you see who stabbed Aisha Nash? Not treated as much as I'd like them to be, but uh, hope they do the job. No, but it's a story element that we added that works. Because yeah, that when we get to the end, mm -hmm. It, it puts another spin on the politics and what the girls were trying to do. Correct. Yep. That's right. <laughs> All right, you can go. You can see slight shadows in, uh, at, in Deesa's office. Yuri and I, again, were playing with shadows. Uh, we didn't really have as much time or equipment as we had planned on. But uh, within the confines of what we had, we wanted to work, as I mentioned before, with shadows, high contrast, and um, a lot of things. This prison was a strange place. We were told by the Nashville crew, whom, by the way, I have to give a big shout out to, um, wouldn't have made it through shooting this film without the Nashville crew, the North Carolina crew, and the L.A. crew, whoever came from everywhere, because actually I prepped this film in two states with two different producers. It's been a, an experience. And why didn't you shoot it in the first state, Nima? Well, why didn't you shoot in North Carolina? <laughs> well, the reason why I didn't shoot in North Carolina was because um, the two producers who are executive producers, Jeff Clanagan and Steve Black Lockett, who executive produced Lockdown and uh, used to work Stuff with, Master, with P, Master P, right? And are before, out there now. And are out there now uh, producing, producing and, and, and working things, and hustling. Things. Yep, they're both doing shout wonderful out to things. Them. Definitely shout out because, you know, they're both uh, wonderful guys. They had had the original script that Preston had written, and they had submitted it to this very small prison in North Carolina. And so the, the Departments of Correction had approved it. And so we went down there first. And when I saw the prison, I fell in love with it. It was just perfect. It was so small. It was closed down, except for the sweatshop, which I found out. And, you know, I was like, this, this will really work, because um, we didn't have that much money. And so they asked for me to submit the rewrite, and I submitted the rewrite that Joyce did, and suddenly they denied me access to the prison. They suddenly told me that, you know, they didn't want me to shoot this prison, and uh, the second script did not properly represent the Department of Corrections, and that um, I shouldn't bother attempting to get into any prison in North Carolina because <laughs> it's not going to happen. Mm. And, and, you know, it was very... In, in fact, it's interesting you bring that up, Joyce, because it was actually at that point that I really realized that I had something special here. You think, uh, Francis the first script had something special here. There were many differences, but the major difference in the two drafts was the politics. And so um, we went to, we were shipped off to Nashville. Francis, I didn't even 
You know, I remember standing in front of that small prison that the um, guards were telling us it was closed down. Then I saw these trucks there. Uh, and I won't mention the corporation of the trucks, but it's well-known things that we buy every day. And I was like, what are they doing here? And inmates were in there working. And he said, well, the prison is closed down. But the sweatshops are never closed. They're always open for business. Because there are a multitude of corporations that have closed down their own shops and sweatshops. And many Americans have lost their jobs, their pension and welfare. Uh, their retirement funds, etc., because many corporations are now doing business with prisons. And so that's interesting. And we knew that, that it was something uh, true. Yeah. I just want to say that in, in the first draft, there was mention of the corporation coming oh, to the prison. Absolutely. And that's what motivated us to do more research. But we knew that that was a story element that needed to be blown up. Yes. And to be a part of what motivated these young women to do what they did. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. That, that uh, was very important. Yes, it was. And it was fact, it was a line in Preston's original script that motivated me to sit down at the computer and type in prison as business, which was part of the redevelopment of the, you know, m most deaf character. Um, to find out what's going on. To um, use him as a vehicle. Use him as a vehicle. I want to talk about the music, if if we could. Um, that was Sweet Honey and the Rock. Right. Under that, um, under that little montage. Yeah. Political consciousness, part of our tribe, came in and uh, let us use a song. Right. Also, it, earlier we heard Olu Dara. Right. Um, Absolutely. Very important. The blues song when the girls are standing outside of the um, sweatshop. Right. Francis's first morning. Right. And uh, he is. Uh, very special contributed. Uh, oh, definitely. Uh, uh, those the... were two songs that I really pushed the studio to pay for. <laughs> Olu and I go way, way back. Uh, he's married to one of my best friends. And we grew up together in Harlem, and we thought it was very important to add. I really pushed for those additional elements, and Olu is a phenomenal uh, musician, and uh, Joyce and I were very happy, and so was Mandrill, for him to be an addition to... Um, the musical, Absolutely. yeah. Now this scene I want to talk about for a minute. This scene, I'm just glad that I got to finish. Uh, because in this scene, we really get to see both sides of the fence. And from additional research, you know, we found out that there's guards associations who are against the privatization of prisons because the guards who get jobs through special favors, like Michael did, you know, he knew the warden and his brother was tight with the warden, and that's he, how he got his job. And another reason why family's tight. Right. Another reason why I chose Most Deaf is because of his physical stature, because he doesn't look like a guard. And in many private prisons, many guards don't have the physical ambience needed, you know, to control people, but they, they get the jobs as favors. It was very important for me to illustrate the balance of this whole privatization versus federal prison system. And in this scene, which, um, which I think came out very well, I think it illustrates the point. You hear the viewpoint of the, of the guards. Yeah and the guard captain and what their lives are like. You know, it's rough sometimes, man. You know, it get rough, you know. Wait, when we get Because in prison, it's, it's, in our story, it's, it's a bad situation for everybody. It's yes. bad for the girls. It's bad for the guards who are overworked and underpaid yeah. and yeah. under a lot of stress. Yeah. And you, when you put all those elements together, you have to have an explosion. Jesus Christ. Also, just to make sure the audience understands that um, there are guards who are upset, who work in the Department of Corrections, are very, who are very upset that there are untrained people getting positions. You, got you know, there's a whole big battle going on. It just makes the Department of Corrections guards' job more difficult. And as I watch this scene and I look at how it came out, I think about the character of Deese, you know, and uh, I guess some things happen for the best. Uh, 
I remember telling Joyce, well, we have to balance him out, and, you know, we want to... We want the audience to know why he's like this, you know, and this and that. We had a few additional lines that were written during this scene to uh, explain these. But Joyce was like, you know what? He's just evil, Nima. And, uh, you know, we were in editing with yeah, David, and we, we just agreed. To, we didn't need to tell why. No, we and we didn't care, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, you I know. I mean, we have some sense of it. Because the other guy says, you know, he's been here 17 years. Yeah. And yeah. But that was but, enough. But that was enough. We didn't mm. we didn't need to know. And so that it becomes a classic um, good versus evil story right. Right. as a right. result of that. Right. But here we go. Yeah. With the, um, the, the politics and using Michael as the conduit for, uh, for that as he becomes curious, something he reads in the... Uh, in the guard magazine and prison magazine about the prison industrial complex. Right, and then he goes home and and begins to research it. And as De, you could hear Debrat's voiceover, as she talks about, um, you know, making ski coats for a dollar fifty a day that someone in Paris is paying fifteen hundred dollars for. We were not allowed to use names of corporations in the film, and Joyce and I felt comfortable with not doing that. But you know them all. Yeah. <laughs> all you have to do is just go on your, co your computer and look up prisoner's business. And let me say, we did that We did that on purpose because we knew that we couldn't give, well, we're not politicians, let me say that. Mm -hmm. We are artists, but we wanted to raise the issue of prison as business, and we knew that we couldn't be preachy with it. Mm -hmm. So the device that we came up with was to put those three words into a search engine, prison as business, right. and that if nothing else, the audience could remember that, go home and check it out for themselves Absolutely. and decide what which side of that issue they might fall on. Absolutely. This is an interesting scene, and I thought a very important scene because it really opens up, and I'm glad I shot it now because we had, I hate to keep bringing this up, but um, some really wonderful scenes that Joyce had written that, that were character development scenes, and I didn't have a chance to shoot them, but I did have a chance to shoot this one, which is good because it tells the audience a little bit more about the characters. And I'm looking at the green paint, and I'm thinking... <laughs> We didn't have any money, and so Yuri and I decided to paint the cells deep colors, and you'll see a lot of deep greens and deep blues, you know, because we wanted, um, I very much wanted the internal strength and the youthful hopefulness of these inmates to come through against the drab look of the prison. With no money, the only thing I can think of was to have Cindy paint, and it worked out quite well. Also, I used Fuji film to shoot this, Yuri and I, because Fuji, I have to give a shout out to Fuji, because Fuji is really good to work with when you're working with many skin tones, and particularly people of color. The colors Which Yuri is so good at really shooting. pop. Yes, he is. And, um, Yes, he is. Uh, Yuri Nyman is, uh, like I said, <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful director of photography, and we worked together, and this is our third film. And, uh, you know, Yuri was with me for the two or three months I was on the road in two states uh, prepping this film, and we worked in very, very difficult circumstances. And if you guys see smoke coming out of the young lady's mouths, know that that smoke is real. It, it was cold. <laughs> Also, the song that we just heard was, uh, under that was Sunshine. Right, by Mandrill. Mandrill old, right. It's a new song, but it's old school, old, old style. school flavor. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. I see Monica Calhoun looking in the background. I have to say a word about Monica. Oh, who is, yes. And Lark, uh, who are both very, also very phenomenal Lark young Voorhees. actresses. Yark Voorhees, a lot of you may know her from Saved by the Bell and a lot of other features she's been doing lately. Monica was this one of the stars of The Best Man. She played the bride, and she was in Players Club with uh, Lisa Ray, and uh, she's done quite a bit of work. Um, I worked with Monica first with Dwayne Martin in an after-school special called Different Worlds. It was one of her first acting gigs, and uh, 
We were nominated for several daytime Emmys, and I was very, very happy. It's interesting about Monica because when Joyce re kind of recreated Wet, and by the way, we, we loved all Preston's names for the film, and Joyce and I kind of saw Monica's playing little mama, you know, and because she's so soft-spoken, and she, but she was determined to play a different character, you know, and I have to give credit to Monica came Absolutely. to work okay? every day. She was not playing. She came with bantu knots, skull caps, and a mentality that created a wonderful wet and and um, hard little revolutionary. Yes, she was. <laughs> and Mark Voorhees uh, was someone I never thought would be the type of young woman who would be in jail. Um, I love one of the lines that Joyce gave her when when Lisa Ray when Francis asked her, "What are you in for?" And she, Lisa Ray says, I killed my husband, but it was an accident. And she says, I killed my stepfather, but it wasn't no accident. Well, let um, me say, that's Preston Whitmore. Well, Preston did a great give job. Give I, Preston credit I will now. give cre Preston, that's I love you for line. that line. Um, you know, it, it just everything works so well. I, I forget who did what sometimes, but um, I love that line. Was denied. But Lark, when I was in Nashville, I visited several other women's prisons and I was shocked to find middle-class girls like Lark in jail and uh, I realized then that um, that Lark would work and she really did a great she's job. She's wonderful. She's wonderful and uh, it was she was a joy. They were all a joy to work with. They were really all a joy to work with. It's amazing performance isn't it? I mean I have to say it. I have to say it but you Thank know you I have did. so much respect for uh, for what you do, you know, you are a strange genius kind of woman. Oh, well, thank you, and, Joyce. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about all that, you know. Um, I don't know about no, all that. No, it's true, it's true. This, we would not be sitting here in this room making this commentary if it were not for you, so I just got to <laughs> Well, I think, I I think it's a team effort. I think it's a team effort, and I'm looking at the film, Joyce, and I'm thinking, um, once again, guys, we're here at the sweatshop. Now, this location was really, I, I fell in love with this location. Unfortunately, once again, I didn't have the extras or the dungarees that I wanted them to sew to fill the room. What took the warden's rejection pretty now, here we're coming up against a scene that, um, as Joyce and I mentioned before, we had to put the film together in a different kind of way, which, which I'll talk about later, which is how... David and I created a style of editing the film. <laughs> Ooh, word up. I am so tired of lights out. Actually, uh, there was another character um, that was in the film that we had to, cut, had to cut out when I was down in Nashville because of sudden money problems. And she was a young prostitute, and her name was Special. <laughs> Special. And she had a Latino female lover, and um, the lover was getting ready to get out. And so actually this scene was supposed to be a big party that they had snuck and put together to celebrate Special's girlfriend getting out of jail. That's why we shot this. But then when the stove blows up, uh, her she girlfriend gonna gets get killed, killed and you see. propel the girls forward in there. Exactly, and movement. they have the funeral and then special, you know, so, so she gets killed in the explosion. But as you can see, no one gets killed in the explosion because those scenes were never shot. Um, so, and those characters disappeared. And those characters disappeared. So. But you know what? It's okay. Yeah, we got the explosion, and uh, it was it was interesting. Um the style of the film, style, the editing style of the film, as you can gather by now, was created out of a great need to make the film work in some kind of way that would draw the attention of the young audience that we initially, you know, that we decided to go for. Um, and uh, David and I worked, we worked several styles out, but... Uh, when you see the uh, black and white or you see the flash frame, you know, it, of course, as you filmmakers know, it's, sometimes it's an attempt to cover something but uh, or to bridge something, but also to create a rhythm to propel the film forward. Maybe next time, okay? Well, thanks for thinking about it. No problem. But you know I'm not that big on golf anyway. Yeah, but you do play some games now, don't you? Yes, sir? I'm talking about that little explosion in the kitchen. Uh, any truth to it? 
No, sir. And I'm glad we got to make this, to shoot this scene, because we also found from our research that, you know, there are quite a few wardens on the take here. <laughs> So between Deese and Ward Nelson, who 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 was more greedy? You know, um, <laughs> they're working together, they're, but then each of them has their own agenda that's right. and what and what they want to do. That's right. So this this scene is good for them. Shante Wright came to me circulating a petition that you didn't even know about. I mean, when people get put away behind bars, they you know they don't often get visitors. They're kind of locked out from the outside world so a lot of things go on that no one really knows about and um, the wardens and the guards they realize that a lot of people don't know about it and they take advantage of it sometimes I'm gonna put you right back where I found you in the Florida swamp walking a guard tower really is a world that people don't know about I mean there are surprising things for us in the research about what goes on in, in prison in general. The beauty of life is knowing you are loved. As time passes, knowledge and Again, back to the politics. Mm -hmm. During the times that I really wanted to have a dolly and didn't have, as you notice, uh, we went handheld. In this particular scene, I asked Yuri to tilt the camera and, you know, just make an attempt at the, for the visual, for the cinema to help distort the environment of the scene. Something really wonderful I thought happened in this scene. Um, as we were shooting it, Lark and Nabushe, I told Lark, Nabushe, and Lisa Ray to all go with their own feelings. And Lark started to fold her hands and she started to pray. And I, I don't know if it was the cold weather or the environment or what we were going through, but it just moved me so much that I shot it and I put it in the movie. I thought it was important, a re really a good mm -hmm. character point for her. Yeah, it's a good character point for Wet, too, because we have her being dragged into uh, isolation, isolation for Absolutely. her political activities. Absolutely. And it, that also helps to galvanize the girls and brings them together. Absolutely. And I had also created another sweatshop scene that, I'm uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to shoot, uh, which I thought was important um, when Wet goes down into isolation. Uh, she was to be brought down to a... Um, basement area where the girls are in their underwear and they're tearing off Made in Honduras labels and sewing on Made in America labels, which is against the law and which is what some prisons do. Do they really do that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, and then we were going to see Some prisons, she, none that we know of, <laughs> but interesting uh, world. Get that piece of cobweb up there, road. And the issues around women in prison, you know, women are seen differently. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but uh, there's a lot of shame around women going to prison mm -hmm. because a lot of people feel like, you know, you should, you should have been a good girl, and uh, how could you have ended up in prison? And so we put that as part of Deese's character, that he has that attitude that... Um, that they're just bad girls, that uh, he takes it upon himself to discipline and to, um, there's a line earlier, that I don't think we kept it in the movie, but he says, I'm going to beat you like your father should have beat you. It's in there, but it's, yeah. To, uh, to put you back on the, on the straight and mm -hmm, narrow. Mm -hmm. So, um... It's in there, but there's, there's real, a sound effect that hits, yeah, unfortunately hits Real it. stigma of women, uh, mm -hmm. about women going to prison, and we wanted to bring that element here. And this is the signing the petition. Uh, Mandrill, put your money where the funk is. Yep. In a few days, they got the petition signed, and people organized it right under Deese's nose. We kept Tashina. Remember, she plays all the way through. Now yeah. as a as an element 
to get to the guard captain at the end. Mm -hmm. So what they say? Walcott changed the date on this. To when? Or next Thursday. Everything was going fine till Lil Mama came to work one day and found out that Walcott had changed the date. They flipped the script on us, so we had to flip it back on them. Most of these scenes that you see were, um, all of them, none of them were rehearsed, and all of them were, if there was a rehearsal, it was on the set while the camera was being set up. So, I, again, I have to commend the actors for their performances and for trusting me to guide them in times when they, you know, just couldn't even think because it was so cold and the circumstances were, were, were pretty bad. So, to all you young filmmakers out there who are frustrated while you're shooting your first film, Make it work, because <laughs> you can always do magic in the editing room, you know. Um, well, that's where real creativity comes through, you know, separates. Yeah, but it's a combination of the two, because you have to have, as David says, good film to put a film together, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's a combination, but you can do magic. You're right, Joyce, in the editing room. Well, one of the things we wanted to do here was to... Um, uh, in this conversation where uh, 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 Nikki says to Francis, you read the petition, we found out that a lot of girls that are in prison are uneducated and uh, may not be able to read, um, but didn't, didn't work for, for uh, the actress, so we, we took that out. No, the actually, fact that she wasn't able to read. Well, no, actually, we were going to shoot the nighttime scene. Uh, that you oh, had of right, her right. of her pacing, but we, that was an interior cell, and, being and I never worried, got to shoot yeah, that. Yeah, right. being worried that she wouldn't be able to That's say the correct. words. That's correct. That's right. So I, I I didn't I couldn't shoot that, but there was a whole internal scene with her going through her fear of the whole situation, you know. And and I had planned to shoot that. That's but, right. I forgot we had that. Yep, but that never happened. Here we are bringing in the corporate people. Uh, they were locals, and I uh, worked with what I had. I think Reed is fabulous here, and Clifton are fabulous here because they play good Uncle Toms, you know. <laughs> and uh, what is an Uncle Tom? Uh, they, they always they they uh, uh, Reed is very so far from an Uncle Tom. I cannot tell you, and I thought he really played it well. This is one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, mine too. Um, Though, um, I have to tell those filmmakers out there, there were a few changes in editing and sound effects that I wanted to make. Unfortunately, I never got to lay back the sound mix. Dave, David uh, did a fabulous job with the sound mix. Dave West? Dave West, who um, I wrote to the DGA to make sure he got an upfront credit for because he put many months in, in sound designing, which I believe is, pr is, is so vital for filmmakers to know about, you know, sound can take your audience places that are not on the screen, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they could, it could just oppose images and uh, counteract images and really add a multitude of layers to your film. Um, I never got to, unfortunately, lay back the sound, I wanted to make changes, and also David and I wanted to make changes in the flashes, but despite all that, first of all, I have to say, um, this was a very important scene. Uh, it was supposed to be our Norma Ray scene. Again, I have to say we wanted like three, we were supposed to have 300 extras, but um, I love the music that Mandrill created in this scene. And uh, Tribal when, drums. Tribal drums. Drum and beat. when you hear the chant, that is Joyce. <laughs> Joyce's beautiful voice <laughs> chanting out. It was very important, um, which has been kind of a theme in many of my films that I've done. When my AFI film, Sky Captain, was also about uh, African-American, West Indian, and African people, cultures blending, and, and the similarities in uh, their spirit, you know. And uh, uh, Mandrill and Joyce really worked together to bring me exactly what I wanted in this scene musically, and I was very, very happy with it. This is a song called Uhuru Sasa. Uhuru Sasa are Swahili words that mean freedom now. Now, this is another situation, filmmakers, where you think on your feet. Uh, when I got to the location that day, that's when I found out that I wasn't going to have any extras. And so I talked to Yuri and I said, you know, we have to shoot this a different way. I made the decision to shoot high speed and regular speed. 
uh, instantaneously on the set that morning because I, I, I thought that if I had shot high speed and regular speed, I would have two different foundations to cut from to build the energy that I needed and that I was lacking with the amount of people in the scene. You know, I could work with, with the different, with, by shooting some high speed footage and I was very glad I did. Um, now we're coming up to the isolation scene. This Let me, can I just say that it works? That scene oh, is good, so I'm powerful glad. and so emotional. And you know, thank you Joyce. And you know what, to add to that, um, I remember being in the editing room and I was very frustrated because I never got to shoot the reaction shots of the warden and all the, the coverage I thought I needed. And I remember uh, Julie Dash, who's a very close friend of mine, was in the editing room one Daughters day. Daughters of the Dust. Daughters of the Dust and many, many other wonderful films. Um, you know, she was like, Nima, they're never going to let you go back in. You know, the scene is about, it's got to be, you know, about something different. It's got to be about Deese and the girls. And, you know, once she said that to me, David and I were able to go back and recut that scene with what we had and that's why you see it, it, it came out kind of uh, sort of experimental because you know we turned around and made the scene between Deese and the girls um, so you may set out to get have a scene one way but you know you have to work with what you have Nima I gotta I gotta ask you a question mm -hmm. um, again another one of my favorite um, scenes this whole um isolation thing but the girls in a traditional um prison movie um i'm asking you this i already know the answer but these women would be nude right and mm -hmm. this would be a a, mm -hmm. an, a a moment of exploiting their bodies mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. all of that mm -hmm. why did you choose to put clothes on um francis and nikki because i didn't think the nudity was necessary to uh to sell the scene um, you know, nudity wasn't a part of the journey of the story, and I didn't feel it was necessary. So I didn't do it. You know, uh, I didn't. It's want about to image too. It's about it? image, and 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 also the way uh, the scene came out in the final rewrite. Uh, I just love the way Joyce uh, did some of the dialogue abstractly. You know, it was a combination of Joyce and Preston, but. Um, Together it came out very well, and toward the end when Joyce, you know, Joyce rewrote the abstract of them just talking about anything, which is what happens when you're in isolation, uh, it became more about their journey and and uh, their feelings, you know, and opening up uh, than about the nudity. I mean, these girls are gorgeous, and you know, they look good with clothes on or without clothes, <laughs> clothes on, too. but um, I didn't want to make them feel even more uncomfortable because they felt uncomfortable enough. It was zero degrees in there. And I have to give credit to Nabushe and Lisa Ray for hanging in there and, and, and shooting this isolation scene, which was a very important scene. As a black woman, I want to thank you for not shooting them in the nude You're welcome. because first of all it has nothing to do with the scene mm -hmm. secondly they look gorgeous with clothes on or without clothes as mm -hmm. you said and third you know it, they I don't know I don't even know what third is but this third is thank you You're welcome. for not taking us out there You're like welcome. That. it was a pleasure uh, and I know that balancing balancing the images is always important to you yes and it I, is. It I appreciate is. You know, that. it's about the movie and the story and whatever it takes to tell that story. That's what we do. But in this case, it wasn't necessary. Um, uh, I remember telling the Bushy and Lisa Ray just to talk to each other like they're talking to their girlfriends on the phone, you know. <laughs> you see the footage intercut of, with, with most Def again, researching. And I'm sure, as you know by now, there were additional scenes and action that was going on that was supposed to be intercut while they were in isolation, which we never shot. So, uh, you know, David and I put in additional shots of the um, research that was supposed to go somewhere else. But I, th I think it kind of worked to reinforce yeah. uh, the point, you know. It does. brings us back to the politics, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is the journey that you and I wanted to take with them mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. from the beginning. Right. Was to make this a um, uh, journey about, um, you know, the truth. The truth. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was trying to select the correct words there. Stay focused. Repeat after me. Five times two. Five times two. Say it. It's ten. Five times two.
this particular scene, I think, for uh, Joyce, for those young filmmakers who uh, bought the, the DVD or are renting it and want to hear, you know, our commentary, I think it's a good example of what editing can do with uh, mm -hmm. in helping a scene move around. Absolutely. Um, when um, we were originally set to shoot this scene, we again had additional scenes that we wanted to cut in to create time lapse and really to push the B story and other additional uh, points you know, through, but we didn't get a chance to do it, and uh, because I feel, as the director, I feel uh, the nature of the way Joyce wrote the scene, which went from expositional to personal to abstract, um, and, you know, a combination of, of elements, uh, David Beatty, my editor, was able to take this scene and really, on his own, design the edit, and that's a credit to him. Um, you know, I put my two cents in here and there, but he was he he was instrumental and in built the building. Uh, I gave him the rhythm and he built the scene. You know, and I think it came out quite effectively. Yeah. And uh, Mandrill's music in this scene really added to the the insanity toward the end that Joyce wrote. <laughs> Psychedelic, Psychedelic yeah. of being in isolation. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, that was a set built in the confines of the prison and um, you know I wanted to have some flexibility that was one opportunity I had a chance to shoot high angle and with no ceiling because that was a set that Cindy built and I was grateful for that I would like to bring up a, a point about sound that's not, that actually isn't a small point. If you notice, if you, if you heard in the isolation scene voices of women who you could not see, it was because um, we had to use, a, we had a very talented loop group uh, that, we, that we used to our advantage to fill the frames with ambience that we could not shoot. Sound can often be used that way. So when you're making your film and you feel frustrated that you don't have uh, the time or money to shoot the necessary, you know, additions that you need, try sound design. Try using uh, sound as a way to bridge the gaps. It really helped me in civil, with Civil Brand uh, quite a bit. I depended on sound. I was grateful to get Dave West to design the sound and uh, grateful to the Loop Group you know, that brought such fascinating voices to the table because without that, it would be quite empty. That was an interesting process, working with the, the, the loop group. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, having the opportunity to sit in and um, to write lines for them. It wasn't just, um, you know, catch as catch can. We knew what we wanted um, them to say and oh, where exactly. we wanted to put their uh, their lines. Absolutely. So that, Absolutely. that was great. Um, mm -hmm. So writers, you know, think about being a part of the post-production process and, um, um, you know. Oh, absolutely. It's essential. You, you know. don't just want, want them saying anything. You don't want their interpretation. Mm -hmm. It works better when you can give them something specific to oh, say. Oh, definitely, and always. Make, and make their participation more meaningful. Right. Take her back to the home. No. Take her black ass to the home. Take her to the home. No, no, I'll do whatever you say. Don't, please. Please, whatever you say, Captain. Just, no, 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 no. Tell me you're going to be a good bitch. I'll be good. I was just going to talk about this location for a minute. Um, the location, uh, this particular shot I stole and shot it in practical daylight. Yuri and I, um, we were not, I was not supposed to go to this location within the prison. It was full of pigeon crap and all kinds of things that got my crew very sick. But when I peeped through the hole and saw uh, the depth of field of this particular location within the prison, I had to use it. So I did use it, and Yuri and I went down there, and we timed it with, the, with uh, the daylight and sunlight coming through the window, and we shot it without any lights. And um, I think it came out very effectively. I mean, we couldn't have production designed it to look better. And so that's, 
I advise you to do that too, filmmakers. Steal where you can, you know. <laughs> Just don't get caught. So interesting looking at these scenes and, and just thinking about how well received this film um, is in the um, in the community and, mm -hmm. and the feedback that we're constantly getting that uh, that this is real, you mm -hmm. know, this this is an imaginary world that we're um, operating in here on screen, but you know, it touches so many people's lives. Yes, it does, and that's sad. That yeah. it does touch so many yeah. people's lives, yeah. but um, well, I think you know is reality. No, you're right. You're right, Joyce. But also, I think that um, you know, particularly people of color are so seldom seen in a dramatic uh, frame of mind in a dramatic milieu, and they so seldom have the opportunity to emote that uh, any any show of uh, strong emotion is always characterized usually as melodrama mm -hmm. or overacting, you know. I mean, how much can you overact when you find out that your daughter's been killed by a drive-by, you know? Mm -hmm. I can't see anyone else, anyone responding any less than Lisa Ray's character in that kind of situation, you know, or a sister right. who has to break it to her, you know, right. um, or a woman who's been in and out of jail, like Nabouche's character, and who is at the mercy of a guard like Deese who has to say she'll be a good bitch, you mm -hmm. know. Um, we often hear that, and um, I think one of the good things about Civil Brand, and hopefully it has done some of that already, is decode and recode, decode the old stereotype of what we're supposed to be like and how we're supposed to respond emotionally and, and recode it with, you know, the real thing. Yeah, the lawyer said, all we need to do is get hard proof. People living real lives with real emotion mm -hmm. and uh, real problems. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why, you know, this little film that was originally designed to go straight to video has uh, not only been released in the theaters and done well in film festivals, but is um, out there doing... <laughs> great on the street, <laughs> the bootlegs before this DVD, <laughs> before this DVD But this is DVD released. is better because... This one is, no, because it has a commentary. Well, because, and, and the quality and is the quality better. quality of it, too. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just talking to the um, popularity of the film and the mm -hmm. fact that people are loving this film enough that they were going to the theater and buying the bootleg mm -hmm, on the street. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, yeah, exciting. Mean, do we want the bootleg business? No, we don't. But it it's also a reality. Uh, it's a, it's 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 a you big know. compliment. You and know. we got a lot of respect. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Just you're <laughs> on right. The street. You're right. So, you know, I I'll you're just right. that, that that's important. That's important. This is a scene that you're seeing now. I I ran into a uh for those filmmakers again listening, ran into a time problem because again there were scenes additional scenes that was supposed to be there and my problem was how do I do a film time lapse uh, and show what Lisa Ray has gone through her character Francis has gone through with the loss of her child and come out you know months later and so I decided to do a close-up use well, I had to use what I had which was a close-up of Lisa Ray freeze it drain the color into black and white and dissolve it to this scene and then bring the color back and I think it worked this is one of Joyce's favorite scenes, yeah. <laughs> favorite lines. How we gonna get them, right? Yeah. So how we gonna get them? Oh yeah. This scene, I must say, guys, you know, w w when the girls turned around and started getting revenge, I have to say, I was uh, spiritually getting my own revenge for all the shit that we had to go through to make this movie. Oh really? This was the exciting it, part this to me. Wasn't a, <laughs> a walk in the park to make this movie? <laughs> I really was happy about how how Joyce was able to rewrite Sabrina and we were able to connect the dots of all the scenes we didn't shoot and make this happen the way it happened because um, I wanted to show these young women fighting back. You know, revolution is made on youth, usually. And uh, uh, I think that the energy and the desire of these young women that, that they have to live uh, shows in this film and the fact that they are victims of their environment. It was very important for Joyce and I to have these characters admit that they did the crime and they don't mind doing the time. 
but I want revenge on that. They're not convicts that will tell you, I don't belong in jail. They know they belong there. But what they say is that being us, you know, being used and abused and used as slave labor for no wages was not part of what the judge sentenced them to, and, and that was important. They came up with a plan, but they needed somebody's help from the inside. So they asked Michael. Excuse me. Um, exactly right. Another thing that we wanted to show in this film is that um, this is a film that will hopefully um, talk about um, choice and that um, that young women and young men who see this film will think about the choices that they make in their lives mm -hmm. every day that could land them in jail over, mm -hmm. you know, stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. the stuff that could have been Wet avoided. Says, stupid shit. But know? just the, the the exuberance of youth and not thinking and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. You know, um but the bottom line of that is is choice at every moment of every day. We all make uh choices and try to and to try to make the best choices um that we can absolutely I, you know yeah, so that right. that's a theme that Nima and I are very strong on mm -hmm. and wanted to portray in this film you know I look at these high angle shots and these flashes and I really wish that Lionsgate would have let me do these these effects on digital and shoot them back on film but hey you know, it's water under the bridge, right, Joyce? It is. <laughs> it's water under the bridge. Um, yeah, it's water under the bridge, Nima. And somehow this film has a life of its own. You know, it's interesting that we uh, originally thought of the audience of this film as being, um, you know, the fans of the Brat and uh, uh, a younger age group. But what we have found is that uh, everybody is going to see this film, the mothers and the fathers, the grandmothers and grandfathers, the kids, the uncles, the babies. The middle classers with credit middle, cards who go exactly. to um, film festivals. And so th that's been very, uh, very rewarding, very mm -hmm. surprising mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and very re mm -hmm. rewarding. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, unfortunately, when this film was marketed or not marketed, as the case may be. No, it wasn't marketed because there was no marketing um, plan. <laughs> that, well, uh, that wasn't By the taken... the studio. That wasn't taken into, uh, that wasn't taken into account, that there was a market out there because we work hard to make sure that there was a market mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. We did grassroots marketing of our own. I think we for did the, pretty for very the very festivals. well with the with the uh for the two years that we marketed it. I think it just got messed up when it got in the hands of uh you know, the studios theatrical department, but you know, hey, what else is new with black films? You know, which is one of the problems of black films, how they are marketed, uh the ignorance to who their market is and uh the arrogance. The arrogance, yeah. There's a lot there's a lot going on there and um we you can know, talk about that. Okay. Yeah, civil civil brand civil brand was experienced quite a bit of from uh, the poster they created, which was totally exploitative, uh, to um, their denial to admit that we won four film festivals and were official selection of Sundance and AFI, and their refusal to put the festival lease on on the poster, and it was just you know it wasn't really about money; it was about a battle of wills, and and that's another story. But anyway. There's a lot of answers or, or to these questions, and one of them is self-distribution or independent distribution, but I don't know when that's going to come around. I think that young filmmakers, particularly filmmakers of color, have to be prepared for that, that the battle just begins uh, as the film is uh, in the can and done, and then the marketing begins, and so I think that and then you know, the nightmare that was, begins. That that was a shock for us. Yes, we it thought was. that this film, after doing so well in film festivals, would be embraced, yep. would be marketed properly, and that there would be money behind that. And uh, to our shock, um, that none that of didn't that happened. Happen. So filmmakers have to be prepared for that. I can't be there right now. Also, one of the exciting things for me in uh, the journey of making Civil Brand was 
the, all the support from uh, particularly black audiences around the country. Uh, you know, and I have to give a shout out to the American Black Film Festival, to Black Cinema Cafe, to Urban World Film Festival, to Pan African, Pan -African Film Festival, to AFI Film Festival, to Sundance, Roxbury to the Film Roxbury Festival. Black Film Festival, uh, and to, you know, all of the folks who wrote and emailed and supported this movie. Um, Thousands of emails. Yeah, yeah. And, um, our, our, the concerns in our community are not often addressed by cinema. And in a dramatic and, form. And, yeah, well, I think in any form, but cinema mm -hmm. is the most political tool we have. It is the most powerful political tool we have, and it's not often used that way for us, and, and, and sometimes it's on purpose. You know, and, and the journey of Civil Brand has brought us a lot of love because we made this film for you, and um, the nuances that were put in there, um, some of the dialogue, and... Uh, the choices that we made were made because we wanted the film to be familiar, you know, and um, you know. And it's proven that yes, that we it were, has that we were uh, correct. Yes, it has. In our choices, you know, and, and in our direction. Exactly, and for you know the audience to remember that this Silver Brand was not a signature piece for Joyce or I. We were hired to uh, make this film, and what we did was just make the necess changes necessary we thought that would make us comfortable, you know, in making a film of this nature. This scene, you know, again, uh, as most of you have noticed, most death was supposed to be throughout this whole sequence and all the way until the end of the film. Uh, but uh, he could not make it both times we had set the date for the final one day shoot and so eventually I just had to go without him you know and um which writers I'm sure you can uh, <laughs> imagine what a nightmare that was for me yeah. to uh, try to explain why we see most death in the infirmary at the top of this scene <laughs> and then when we went back to shoot the conclusion of the scene uh, he wasn't available, and I had to explain why he wasn't there. But uh, we had Sabrina. Yeah, I love uh, Joyce gave her a great line. Uh, she explains she by saying um, they let they let uh, Michael go because they didn't have no beef with him. He was just a good guy caught up in a bad situation. So everything had to get turned around. Event. Uh, most Def's character, Michael, was supposed to, you know, get the tape, get it out. Uh, there were several great scenes set for with the between the warden and and, and uh, most Def's character that never got shot. But uh, you know, in editing, uh, and and since Tashina was present the final day, I just we just had her grab the tape and it worked out because she was the one who saved the day. Um, and it and it was a good thing. And the girls, you know, had something meaningful to hold on to their but lives meant something their, in the, their lives their meant sacrifice something. meant something in the end that was the story we wanted to tell that right all uh, the sacrifice of of our people is is meaningful absolutely on every level that's right here again you know editing tricks guys uh uh, attempting to build what was written, but what I could not shoot, you know, for the finale of the film. And um, it was not easy. Oh, there's Robert, by the way, who is a wonderful actor who uh, I cast in Nashville, who I saw in Sundance, who was one of the finalists for Project Greenlight. I was uh, hoping that you got it, but uh, he's, he was wonderful in the film, and it was just a pleasure working with him. And uh, I, I send a shout out to you too, Robert. We miss you and I hope you're happy with the final product. As I was saying, this particular sequence up uh, was problematic for me in many ways. And um, primarily because I didn't have the footage that I needed to build a dramatic ending. Uh, I got some of it and uh, I have to thank Joyce, Cliff, and especially Reed, uh, the warden, because I think if he hadn't been such a great actor and improv and paced up and down, as Joyce says, we wouldn't <laughs> have had much to cut back and forth to mm -hmm. to build the ending. And so, but he I, built. He helped to build that tension. Yes, he That's did. Great. Yes, he did. He helped to build the tension. This part of um, this infirmary sequence was shot 
at Lacey Studios in Los Angeles. Yeah, this is the Nashville and L.A. Right, it's all mixed up. This is my first, one of all, my first AD, who, <laughs> Sam Mahoney, who's a great personal friend of Big Joyce, Sam. both Joyce and I. Who, we've done several movies together who came on and performed a miracle on that final one day. And because of his great planning, I was able to shoot the 41 setups. So shout out to you, Sam. He also doubled as an actor. Our, big, our mountain man. <laughs> our mountain man. Came down right. out of the mountains to help us make this movie. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. The previous scene you saw with Nabushe with the gun was, uh, I was hoping that that would be one of the shots that Lionsgate would use when they said, they, you know, when I mentioned that, you know, if you want to put a rifle in your hand, that would be a good shot. I was rather disappointed at the poster because, um, you know, these girls pick up guns out uh, in their youth, youthful impetuousness and, 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 and pain that the fact that their Madonna figure, little mama, has been killed and they don't know what to do so out of their frustration. They fight back. Uh, they're not smiling with guns in their hands, you know, they're not gun-toting mamas. And, and again, I think that's very unfortunate that the film was uh, marketed on the posters that way. Well, you know, yeah, the action, an action kind of you yeah. know thing, and, yeah. and the film is about so much more than that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, this was a strange film to market. Yeah, well, it, um, it, it's a unique film. It's a different film. It's and not action. It's not your typical ghetto genre. No, it is, it's, um, it, it has humor in it, and it has drama in it. You know, and um, and if you've listened to this whole commentary, I'm sure you know by now why it has all these elements. And maybe you could figure out how it came together the way it did better than Joyce and I can figure out how it came together the way it did. We got to make our demands. We got to do what real revolution I'm looking at the actors, and Lisa Ray really did a fabulous job in this. So did Monica, and the Boucher was phenomenal, and Clifton was phenomenal. They all were troopers, you know, and... Um, like we said earlier, we made a good decision choosing conscious artists because there are a lot of actors or rappers who would not go through a journey like the making of Civil Brand. Lisa Ray was there every time I called her, and the Boucher was there, Monica was there, Clifton was there. Uh, often the actors pay for their own transportation to these film festivals. Um, the only one they didn't, they got carried to by the studio was Sundance, but all of the other festivals, they came at their own expense. They were there helping, promoting, and, you know, just doing everything. And I have to say I love them for that. It was a great mm -hmm. experience. Mentioning the uh, movie and their other interviews. Absolutely. Magazine and radio Absolutely. Interviews. Always pushing the film. Um, you know, two of the songs are the hip hop songs in the film by DeBrat and um, MC Light were given to me for nothing because we had no budget to really buy anything. And um, that was a great thing that they did to give me those songs. So, again, a shout out and thanks to DeBrat and Light for that. This is a scene that Joyce and I are talk were talking about how sometimes you have to make guys with best with what you have. And if you notice, because of Reed's intensity and his improvisational skills, and I just let the camera ride on because he's just an interesting character, that tension I was able to take with David, we were able to intercut some kind of ending because the ending was initially supposed to be lots of... Uh, action and drama. Action and drama, mm -hmm. lots of guards and close-ups of them grabbing guns and a whole big thing. And we didn't have any of that, so we had to make it personal. It became personal intensity. That's right, and it worked. It worked well. Mm -hmm. All this was shot that one day, and uh, another another thing for you filmmakers to remember is that I, I can't say it enough. Make with what you have. Yes, I would have loved to have dolly shots and moving moving around and the girls pacing and talking, but I didn't, I only had time to have them stoop down in a tight two shot and say their lines. Yeah, at the end. Yeah, the and end. so you work with what you have. I love the, the this scene because Dees gets slapped around and pistol whipped. <laughs> well, you know, it's that the good versus evil, and of course, you know, in the resolution of that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's got to go down that mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm. Controversial. Uh, yeah, you know, controversial, the... controversial. Well, Civil Brand is a controversial film. The making of the film, of course, I'm sure as you gathered, 
from hearing this this tiny bit that you heard is far deeper than what we 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 can say on tape. But um, it was a unique journey, a very interesting one, and uh, one that I'm sure Joyce and I will never forget. It's a special film, mm -hmm. and I think that it's touched by a higher spirit because it has a message that may, even if it saves just one life. That's right. We did our job. If and one, yeah, one young person makes a, a changes the the way they've been making their choices, and um, we'll be happy. We'll be happy. We will be happy, and uh, we're 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 just we feel blessed that the film came out in the theaters at all. It was it was a great experience to see it up on the big screen. Uh, alive and in living color, and mm -hmm. it was a greater experience to witness tears and laughter and associations and all kinds of feelings. Uh, interactive screening, interactive, you know, viewing. It was just great. It was great. I it hope was. I hope our next movie gets that kind of interactive I know, thing. I know. I know. You know, know, it was just a great thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, an amazing. Uh, this was this is another scene that was shot. Mm -hmm. This is another scene that was shot at Lacey Studios. As you see, we had a very busy day that day. <laughs> very busy day. And we worked from can't see to can't see. Yeah. This was a conscious choice I made not to shed the blood of uh, Francis and the Boucher. Um, I I made this choice not to do it, whether I had the budget or I didn't. You know. Um, I didn't think it was necessary to see their blood get and guts to get spilled all over the screen, uh, so I didn't do it. This was another scene that was shot that one day. As you can see, you filmmakers can see it was a tight three. Would have loved to done it another way, but you know had to push everybody in the frame and get what we could get and go and keep going, you know, and it worked. One of the executive producers, uh, Steve Black Lockett, who was down in Nashville with me for the entire shoot, uh, I, I th I'm thinking about him, Joyce, as I'm watching these scenes because he did take a camera one day and get me quite a few of those um, wide uh, gate mm -hmm, gate shots, mm -hmm. and boy, I used I used every frame, and I thank you for that, Black. He and he also, you know, got a lot of the talent. And he brought Cliff to the table, which I'm forever grateful, and uh, Tashina and light, and I'm forever grateful to him for that. And uh, Lark, Jeff brought down, I'm grateful to him for bringing Lark down. We got two choices. We could either wait. Black was there with me, and he knew <laughs> day by day what we were going through, but he hung in there, and he had my back, and he worked, you know, right by my side. And uh, Black, I love you for that, if you ever listen to this. This, this uh, commentary, I want to personally thank you. Uh, you and Jeff for hiring me and for sticking by and me. And me. Thank and, you. And yes, <laughs> for sure. I ain't putting no fucking gun to my head. Fuck that. Boys, this is Cervantes. I'd like to try to talk them out one last time. Nikki! We always talk about that, the Harlem girl and the South Central girl. That's right, Joyce. And we've been some some places in yes, our life. Yes, we have. <laughs> I could not have made this film without Joyce. I could not have made this film without Joyce. I couldn't have made it without uh, my husband. I couldn't have made it without Who's my daughter. Husband? And I couldn't have made it without uh, some of my other best friends like Beverly and Julie. And it's just, uh, I couldn't have made it without my editor, David Beatty, and uh, just so many people involved. It was indeed a work of love, you know. Um, I have to say, I think it's a shame that Lionsgate didn't even think enough of the film to design any kind of marketing plan. Uh, we were ready to do, if you, those of you wondering where the soundtrack was, we were all ready to do the soundtrack with Mandrill and Most Def and DeBrat and Light and several other artists, but uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, that did not happen, and it's unfortunate because it's really a no-brainer. It's inexcusable. 
it's a no-brainer and um but it's a reality it's a reality that we have to face and you have to understand that when you your film goes to a studio whether it be a small studio or a large studio the marketing department will need help in our case they chose not to listen or to take any help and uh, that's when I knew it wasn't about the money it was about a battle of wills because if it had a marketing plan even in its present state it would have made money but uh, that's okay you know, that was their choice. Come on, come on. There were a lot of other elements in the making of Civil Brand, which Joyce and I don't have time to go into right now. We're nearing the end of our journey, as you see, Tashina takes the tape, and, and, uh, and we come back to our bookend yep. with uh, Brad, the reporter. Right. If you notice the quality of this black and white versus uh, some of the other black and white that's sharper, that was because the Lionsgate uh, line producer would not buy the correct film needed. This was shot on Fuji film, and the other black and white shots are rather fuzzy because it was a different stock, unfortunately. Nelson Gottlieb was coming to his ass. But our inmates love the work they do. They leave here with valuable skills, and you have a product you can market around the world. By the time the government <laughs> went to the <laughs> they were totally bankrupt. And I mean, they found so much shit on Nelson that they shut the whole prison down. And his ass is under indictment. Deesh, you should have been there. Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> My girl, Aisha. She got killed in a fight not long no after the takeover. You, I guess she never shook that prison mentality, you know? Damn. That's why we dedicate our victory to the memory of my girls. Wet, little mama. I have to say, Joyce, it really gives me great pride to be a part of developing young black female stars. We did the crime. That's one thing that Hollywood does not do, and that's one thing I think they need to do more. Um, you know, when I watch shows like Entertainment Tonight and Access Hollywood, and I see little spots on these young white actresses who uh, don't have platinum albums or haven't even done as many films as Nabushé, never co-starred with Wesley Snipes and Blade. Exactly. And then you see a film like Civil Brand, and you see all these young, beautiful black actresses mm -hmm. working their asses off and doing a great job. Um, it makes me feel good that I could be, that we could be a part of building young black stars, exactly. particularly the young black female stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, it yeah. feels good. It feels yeah. good. Yeah, and just hoping, you know, that that there will be another opportunity for them to. Uh, display their talents. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention this this artist, this rap artist here at the end uh, that's produced by Mandrill is a young sister named q mm -hmm. that uh, she wrote this this rap, which is fabulous because it's really a summary of the entire movie. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love it. And here's our crew. Like I said, shout out to uh, our makeup supervisor did a beautiful job. And Richard, our prop master, I have to give a special shout out. Richard, I know you're going to get this DVD because I'm going to send you one. And I want you to know I love you and I want you to know we did the impossible. We made it happen and we could not have done it without you, Richard. So I have to do a special shout out to uh, Richard, our prop master, who really was fabulous. Uh, we had a great crew. As usual, our director is nothing but a mere reflection of his or her cast or crew. So, well, we, you know, the cast and crew reflect you. So. <laughs> it was deep. I, I, I'm not it's saying too good. much today, it's Joyce. It's all because good. I, it's all right. Know, I'll say it. I look at this film and I, I get I know, so I know. many different kinds of feelings. I know. We both. But we both, uh, mainly, both guys, do. we are working with the home video department. And uh oh, is that Joyce? That's Joyce. That uh, that this I have to speak on. This well, Joyce is one of my favorite poets, you know, a period. But this poem she wrote 
uh, as a tribute to the film and to the critical resistance movement. And we put it in with Mandrill's music for the finale, and it's just fabulous, isn't it, guys? It's I just, don't know. Stop it. I love this. I, love, I, I just I love it. I, like I just it, love it, love it, love it, and I can sit and hear it. You know, I'm one of the few directors that will sit. I'll sit through the cred end credits before I'll sit through the film for I want, a thousand times. I want to just, I just also want to mention two other artists that contributed music. I want to mention Akeisha, that artist because that's my daughter. Akeisha McKenna. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and uh, also the one son, Lion Ra, who does the uh, black woman song at the very end of the credits. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I'd like to uh, also thank the audience and let the audience know that we have a website. It's called LiveTheaterGang.com. Theater with a R-E. T-H-E-A-T-R-E, Gang.com. And uh, any information you want to know about Civil Brand, its journey, uh, some of the obstacles we went through, or if you want to get in touch with me, Nima Barnett, you can contact me through LiveTheaterGang.com. Uh, which is which is owned and and handled operated. Oper <laughs> and I dedicate this film to my mother, Matthew Hope Barnett. That's mm -hmm. that's at the end. And Hope Barnett is my mother. And before she died in my arms, I was determined to you know finish this film. And uh, she know she helped me on the journey. And mommy, I love you wherever you are. And she taught me one thing, as long as there's life, there's hope. And Civil Brand has reaffirmed that. 